Imagine yourself as a goat herder. You don't have much going on in life besides your goats and tending to your land. One day, you went up the mountains and discovered that your goats started eating this weird berry. You think to yourself, don't you all prefer grass? You then notice your goats getting high, too excited to even sleep during the night. Being a curious individual yourself, you pick up these mysterious berries, mash them, and turn it into a drink. Then you started getting high. You get so high that you made it through your evening prayers without falling asleep. Now that's a miracle. This fascinating fruit captivates you, and you wish for a reasonable explanation, but you can't. So you bring these berries to your local priests. Then they tried these berries and proclaimed, Holy sh**! We can make a business out of this! Father Marcos, what should we call this holy fruit? Father Yashak, what is the name of the land we live in? Why, it's Ethiopia, of course. No, you idiot. I mean our province. Uh, you mean Kaffa? Yes, that's a catchy name. Kaffa. Kaffa. Coffee. Coffee. We're gonna call it coffee. And that's how coffee was born. But besides being the birthplace of this lovable energy drink, is there anything else to Ethiopia's history? Hell yes. Famous for being the only African nation to escape European colonization, and influenced by all three of the Abrahamic religions, few countries in Africa can match Ethiopia's rich history. With Ethiopia being currently embroiled in a huge damn conflict with Egypt, there's no better time to pay attention to this growing East African power. So grab yourself a cup of Ethiopian coffee, and let's take a deeper look to the early days of the Big Mama of Africa. Welcome back everyone to History City. My name is Tim, and today we will delve into the first African country in our long list of nations to cover. Damn. This really is a long ass list. To understand Ethiopia's importance to mankind's history, we will need to take a quick trip to the Awash Valley in northeastern Ethiopia. In 1974, the 3.2 million year old skeletal remains of a female Australopithecine, or in English, the southern ape, was found in the far region of Ethiopia, and was given the creative name of AL2881. But you might know her better as Lucy. While it is still up for debate whether Lucy is a direct ancestor of modern day humans or simply a closely related relative, it is still an extremely important discovery for the origins of the human species. The peoples that inhabited Ethiopia eventually diverged into three linguistic groups, the Semitic, the Cushitic, and the Amotic. This might seem like a trivial fact from thousands of years ago, but trust me, this will prove to be important later on. During some time around the 8th to 7th centuries BC, the kingdom of Damat, calm down Joe Rogan, I know it looks like DMT, but it's pronounced Damat, was formed in the northern Tigray region of Ethiopia. Not much is known about this ancient kingdom besides that it was heavily influenced by the Arabian kingdom of Saba, or Sheba. If you remember the biblical story of Solomon, or if you're a big fan of classical music, you might recall the name the Queen of Sheba. The connection between Sheba and Ethiopia eventually led to the legend that the son of Solomon and the queen of Sheba, Menelik, returned to Ethiopia. And to this day, the descendants of the Ethiopian emperors are direct descendants of the wise king of Israel. By around 300 BC, Damat lost its importance when trade routes no longer passed through the Ethiopian highlands, and the kingdom was split up into a messy bunch of city-states. But one of these city-states stood out among the rest with the name of Axum. The Axumites consolidated their power by the first century BC, and they were the powerhouse of East Africa for the next few centuries, excelling in culture, military, and trade, and in the words of the Iranian prophet Mani, the kingdom of Axum was only matched in its prestige by Persia, Rome, and China. Axum's power went beyond just modern day Ethiopia and Eritrea, but reached as far as the southern Arabian coast and Yemen. During the early centuries of its existence, the Aksumites consisted of both followers of the Semitic god, Astar, as well as Jews. And it was common practice for the Aksumites to erect giant obelisks next to the graves of their kings. Even though it was a rich kingdom, prior to the 4th century, Ethiopia was pretty much cut off from the known world, only having trade contacts with the neighboring Egyptians and Arabs. 
but a young Greek slave brought to the shores of this African empire was about to open the Ethiopians' eyes to a whole new world. When we think of churches today, we tend to think of this, this, or this, but not so much this. And there's still an ongoing but mistaken belief that Christianity is a European religion. The truth is, the Christian faith emerged in the Levant, was first spread to the Anatolian Greeks, and was accepted by various communities in Asia and Africa before it even reached Western Europe. While Europe was still clinging to paganism and Roman polytheism, Christianity was already adopted as the state religion first by Armenia, and then, out of all expectations, by Ethiopia. In the early 4th century, a Syrian Greek boy called Frumentius, along with his brother, were captured by the Ethiopians during a voyage that didn't go very well. But in a surprising turn of events, he was brought to the Ethiopian king Azana's court. You boy! What do you have to offer so that I don't snap your tiny neck? Your majesty, ever heard of Jesus Christ? Your merchants love him, and not only will he forgive your sins, but if you become his follower, your business with the Egyptians and Romans will skyrocket. Your fame will spread. Your kingdom will become strong. Say less. I'm in. Thus, Ethiopia became one of the earliest countries in the world to adopt Christianity, with the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahero Church becoming established sometime around 340 AD. Aksum even had regular contact with their fellow Orthodox Eastern Romans, and Ethiopia had a strong navy that allowed it to dominate the Red Sea trade. A lasting legacy of the Aksumites would be the Ge'a script, one of the few native African writing systems still in use today that was influenced by the Southern Arabs. Once just the sacred script of the Ethiopian church, it was eventually adopted by Ethiopian languages such as Amharic and Tigrinya. So as of this point, we covered two of Ethiopia's connections to the Abrahamic religions, from Judaism with the Queen of Sheba and Christianity with the Aksumites, but what about Islam? Around 615, in the early years of Islam, the followers of Muhammad were persecuted in their homeland of Arabia, and the early Muslims escaped to the kingdom of Aksum in an event known as the Hijrat. Under the Aksumite king Arma, they were settled in the town of Nagash which means that the earliest Muslims in the African continent resided in Ethiopia. By the 10th century, Aksum was in a terminal state of decline, with Islamic forces capturing Egypt in the north and diverting trade away from the Red Sea, which led the Aksumites to eventually abandon the coast and retreat to the western highlands. The death blow came years later when a Jewish queen named Judith laid waste to the Aksumite kingdom in a campaign to end the Christian faith in Ethiopia. Now, it's important to understand that Ethiopia's history becomes a little muddled during the Middle Ages. With the fall of Aksum, Ethiopia was replaced by the Zagwe in the 12th century, and just like Damant, Zagwe was shrouded in mystery. However, it was under their rule that the world-renowned Lalibela churches were built. Oh, I'm sorry, these guys didn't build these churches. They were literally cut out of rocks. Yeah, step aside, Brunelleschi, these guys are the real architectural MVPs. By 1270, the Zagways were overthrown by a nobleman named Yakuno Amlak, who claimed that he was a direct descendant of the Aksumites, and therefore King Solomon. The following centuries under the Solomonic dynasty were quite the dynamic years. Ethiopia had been cut off from Europe for centuries, and it was essentially a Christian land surrounded by a sea of Islam. Things started to look bleak for the Ethiopians, as alliance options became fewer and fewer. For the next three centuries, the Muslim Somali Sultanates seemed to edge closer and closer, but Ethiopia was about to make an unlikely friend. This friend wasn't even from the same continent, but from a distant land. They believed in an ancient legend, a legend where a Christian king lived in the Far East. These people, held from Europe, have a small obsession with finding spice and building ships, known as the Portuguese. Hello! And since the next episode will be a country starting with F, don't forget to comment down below which country you'd like to see, and without further ado, let's return to the Portuguese explorers. Finding Prester John was one of the goals of the Portuguese during the Age of Exploration, but luckily for them, they didn't have to go all the way to the Far East. Meu Deus! We found the legendary Prester John! What? 
I'm the Emperor of Ethiopia. Nah, nah, you're Prester John. At a time when Ethiopia was under attack by its Muslim neighbors, the Portuguese proved to be a useful ally since they provided something very useful when it comes to warfare, guns. In the 16th century, Ethiopia and the Somali Adal Sultanate were locked in what was essentially a proxy war, meaning that it was a conflict with the interests of other bigger powers in mind. Behind the Somalis was the powerful Ottoman Empire, and backing the Ethiopians was the Portuguese Empire. Both these great naval powers dreamed of controlling the lucrative spice trade in the Indian Ocean, and whoever's ally controlled the Red Sea holds the key to victory. The Adal Sultanate was trained with Ottoman tactics, but in the end, good tactics wasn't enough to beat Portuguese gunpowder. The Ethiopian-Portuguese friendship was all well and good until the Portuguese intruded a bit too much into Ethiopia's personal space. During the 1620s, Emperor Susenyos I of Ethiopia converted to Roman Catholicism. Whether he did this out of personal conviction or wanted a stronger alliance with the Portuguese, we can't know for sure. But one thing for certain was that this move really pissed off the Ethiopians. Susenyos eventually abdicated his throne due to internal rebellion, and under his son Facilides, Ethiopia's Portuguese Jesuits were expelled and the nation experienced a new cultural climax. The imperial capital of Gondar became the center of the architectural projects of the royal family, with Ethiopian Baroque influenced castles as well as cathedrals covering the city. Remember the part about how thousands of years ago, Ethiopia's population split into three linguistic groups? Well, the royalty belonged to the Semitic Amhara people, but they were not on the best terms with their Cushitic Somali and Oromo neighbors, and the Amhara peoples were just kind of doing their own thing in the west. Yeah, it's all very confusing, but the most important thing to understand is that Ethiopia is a very ethnically divided country. Since the Amhara emperors hadn't treated their neighbors as kindly as they should, the ethnic tensions eventually led to the fall of the empire. Everything quickly fell apart, and Ethiopia entered into a century-long anarchy known as the Zemene Mesafint, or the Age of Princes. From 1769 to 1855, the Oromo princes had effective control over the entire country, with the emperor only serving a ceremonial role, kind of like old-time Japan. During the Age of Princes, life was especially rough since the armies of the warring princes would ravage the countryside, and raids and pillaging became part of daily life, kind of like old-time Japan. And it wasn't until a strong emperor came along, defeated the Oromo princes with a more modern military, and tried to westernize, kinda like all the time. Yeah, you get where I'm going with this. The ruling emperor, Tewodros II, attempted to form an alliance with the British Empire to remove Ethiopia's Muslim neighbors. But after years and years of religious wars in Europe, Britain wasn't so interested in another one. But for Tewodros, this was seen as an insult and he had the British missionaries and other Europeans within the country held hostage. But that wasn't the smartest move, since there is a general rule in warfare written by the wise Sun Tzu, which is gun, beat, spear. The Ethiopian army was armed mainly with spears and outdated muskets, while the British forces had modern rifles and artillery. And just like you guessed, the Ethiopians took a beating. Ethiopia was utterly humiliated and even had their capital occupied. To avoid capture by the British, Emperor Tewodros committed suicide. But Ethiopia had a speedy recovery. Under the next two capable emperors, Ethiopia made up with Britain and became allies and once again dominated East Africa. In the 1880s, under the leadership of Emperor Menelik II, Ethiopia expanded from its western highlands to the Oromo and Sadama lands in the south and the Somali and Afar lowlands in the west. And by 1886, the modern day Ethiopian capital city of Addis Ababa <laughs> it's just so fun to say, Addis Ababa was created in the central province of Shewa. But before the Ethiopians could start their new little golden age, they had another colonial power to deal with. You might be thinking, God, he's gonna talk about the British again. But no, this problem did not originate from London, but from the Mediterranean. This problem is an Italian problem. You see, while the rest of Western Europe had begun colonizing Africa, the Italians were a step too late. Egypt was taken by the British, the Maghreb was taken by France, and almost no free real estate was left in Africa. 
until the Italians found this place called Ethiopia. Mr. Prime Minister, this country of Ethiopia, <laughs> Mr. Prime Minister, this country of Ethiopia, how should we take it? And how should we deal with the emperor? I'm gonna make him an offer, he can't refuse. In the Treaty of Wachale, the Italians pulled a sneaky little linguistic trick. While the treaty in Amharic stated that only Eritrea will become an Italian colony, the Italian version stated they want all of it. And that was not acceptable to Menelik, and both sides prepared for war. Armed with the most powerful weapon on the planet, Italian pride, the modern Italian army made its way to the northern Ethiopian town of Adwa in 1896. And this was where the Ethiopians sealed their fame in history. The Italians underestimated Ethiopia's rough terrain, and the combined lack of supply routes and bad organization led to an Italian defeat. And unlike what the Italians had originally thought, this time the Ethiopians were armed with Russian and French guns. So it ain't as easy as the last time. This victory gave Ethiopia the international spotlight, since it became the only African nation to defeat a colonial power and maintain its independence. Adwa became so significant that the Pan-African Independence Movement adopted the red, yellow, and green colors of Ethiopia's flag. And over 20 African countries today have the national flags inspired by Ethiopia's. While Ethiopia successfully deterred Italian aggression, it was still very much a feudal society. But one man who eventually became the world's most famous Ethiopian, and who inspired a weed smoking religion, was dead set on cashing up with the West. His name is Haile Selassie, the last emperor of Ethiopia. Born in Western Ethiopia in 1892, Haile Selassie was originally named Tafari Makonnen, and since princes in Ethiopia were given the title of Ras, his title was Ras Tafari, and that was the brief etymology of the religion of reggae. Tafari was never supposed to be emperor, but was only a noble who had close connections with the royal family. But after the death of the great Menelik, his successor, Yasu, turned out to be too friendly with Ethiopia's Muslim population and the nobles did not like that. Since Tafari was married to the daughter of the previous emperor, the couple soon replaced the unpopular emperor. Educated by French missionaries and having traveled widely across Europe, Tafari was well known and respected in the West. And with the death of his wife in 1930, Tafari was crowned emperor of Ethiopia and given the new name of Haile Selassie, meaning the might of the Trinity. But just five years into his reign, the butthurt Italians decided to invade once again, but this time with far superior technology. Forced into exile, Selassie toured around the world to seek support against the Italian occupation, and gave a memorable speech in Geneva in 1936. Selassie's speech garnered him widespread support and international sympathy for Ethiopia. With Italy's official entry into the Second World War, the British forces successfully pushed out the occupying Italians with the help of the Ethiopian resistance, and Ethiopia was free once again. But with the war over and the Italians gone, Eritrea became disputed territory. Will it become part of Ethiopia again, or will it become an independent state? That question was answered in 1952, when the UN deemed Eritrea lacking in terms of national identity or sustaining economy, and Ethiopia and Eritrea entered into a federal union. Great job, UN. Great job. You never fail to make the best decisions. During the 1950s, Ethiopia's economy was growing under the leadership of Haile Selassie. There was even a process for the separation of powers, increased human rights, and a gradual westernization of the country. Ethiopia. 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 Oh, how wonderful. So glad you could come. Thank you. Thank you. But in the end, the country was still under an absolute monarchy. The educated, as well as parts of the military, began to question the necessity of an emperor. And in December 1960, with the military failing to overthrow the emperor, Haile Selassie's regime was filled with paranoia. And that's when everything went south. Since the failed coup, Haile Selassie became much more autocratic. The regime decreased the autonomy in Eritrea, effectively annexing the province. The government failed to address national issues such as a failing economy, and any voice of dissent was crushed by the military. 
the government became dominated by the aristocrats and hereditary landowners, returning Ethiopia to its feudal state. And those are only the internal problems. The neighboring nation of Somalia's growing ambitions to take the predominantly Somali Ogaden region of Ethiopia led to war. An Eritrean independence movement began almost 30 years of nonstop violence. And combined with the Ethiopian government trying to cover up an ensuing famine, that proved to be the final straw for the ordinary people. In 1974, with the support of Marxist students, a military coup under the Derg, meaning council in the ancient Ge'ez language, dethroned Haile Selassie and formed a communist state. While official communist records claim the former emperor died from natural causes in 1975, but most credible evidence points to his assassination by strangling under the Derg's orders. With the rise of communist drama in Mengistu Haile Mariam in 1977, the population was subjected to a year-long red terror, where possibly up to 750,000 of suspects against the regime were killed. But even with the support of its new Soviet ally, Ethiopia continued to suffer from its open wound of ethnic nationalism, which only got a hundred times worse. The Ethiopian government no longer just had to deal with its northern Eritrean rebels. The cruelty of the communist regime triggered a domino effect ethnic rebellion. The Tigrays, the Oromo, the Afar, the Somalis, the Sidama all wanted independence from this failing state. These separatist forces had little in common, but they all hated Mengistu to the core. Throughout its entire existence, communist Ethiopia was trapped in a bloody ethnic civil war. As if the civil war wasn't enough, Ethiopia was hit with a devastating famine in 1983, killing over a million. But it was precisely the famine of 83 that brought the world's attention to this unfortunate country once again, through the famous Life Aid Concert. As famous and popular as these performances have become, only parts of the raised funds were received by the famine victims. Since Ethiopia was in the midst of war and chaos, it's speculated that much of the money was diverted to rebel groups and the government. But hey, who knows where it all went. By 1991, the Tigray rebels coordinated attacks against the Derg forces with fellow separatist forces, and successfully took over the capital of Addis Ababa. Mengistu understood that his own army stood no chance against this ever-growing rebellion, and looked to his only ally. Moscow! Is Moscow there? We need military support immediately! Oh, извините, я не говорю по амхарски. До свидания! What the fuck? With the Soviet Union on the verge of falling apart, Mengistu lost its only support and fled to Zimbabwe where he remains to this very day. But even with Mengistu and the communists gone, Ethiopia was still fractured. The rebel groups had little in common. Different organizations supporting a diverse range of ethnic groups all wanted their own chunk of land. The nation was in dire straits, but the leader of the rebel coalition had a plan. Though fragile, it might just keep the country from breaking apart. Put yourself in the shoes of an African general. Your country has just emerged out of a 30 year long civil war. Your economy consists of nothing more than coffee bean exports and scorched wasteland. You have dozens of rebel groups advocating for independence, and the world basically sees your nation as a lost cause. What would you do? And if you were in that position? If you know exactly what to do, you might just be Mela Zanawi, the leader of the Tigray People's Liberation Front. For years, Zanawi fought against the Derg and he understood the ethnic tension in the country well. In order to secure peace in this nation, Zanawi proposed a solution known as ethnic federalism, where Ethiopia will now be divided by regions of heterogeneous ethnic groups, such as the Amhara region, the Tigray region, the Oromo region, and a few more others. Zanawi's new party, the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, damn, that Oh, that's a mouthful, made some progress in improving the nation's infrastructure as well as restoring some semblance of a functioning economy. But Eritrea's independence in 1991, as well as the arrival of another famine, stalled the new government's plans. The EPRDF was of no democratic nature either. While promising equal representation for the different ethnicities of Ethiopia, it marginalized the majority Oromo and Empower peoples, causing the Oromo political parties to reject the new government 
and starting their own insurgency against the state. For years and years, the EPRDF was hindered in its every move by opposing ethnic political parties, and the government became more and more authoritarian as time went on. Censorship of the press became the norm. Hostile relations between ethnicities prevented a healthy civil culture and economic growth. And Ethiopia was trapped in a state of poverty with its never-ending conflict with Eritrea. But the country was finally able to get a breath of fresh air in 2018, with the election of new Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, the first Oromo with this position. Ethiopia might just find peace with the Oromo Rebellion. Ahmed successfully restored relations with the Eritreans and ended a decades-long conflict. And under his leadership, Ethiopia's controversial Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam was near completion. The Grand Renaissance Dam is supposed to provide hydroelectric energy for a nation suffering from severe lack of electricity. And it is estimated to supply power for the neighboring nation of Sudan as well. This project could transform Ethiopia from a standard third world nation into a regional power. Combined with a whopping population of 109 million and growing foreign investments, this country might just get to relive its glory days of Axum. But nothing in life is ever that easy. Due to the fear of water shortage from the Upper Nile, the Egyptian government firmly opposes the dam. So how this conflict will turn out, we still can't really tell. One thing for sure is that Ethiopia is doing everything it could to put itself in the forefront of world politics again, moving away from its famine and war-ridden past to embrace the future with stronger African influence. Perhaps no other nation on earth understands ethnic tension or religious conflict as much as Ethiopia, but this country always seems to find just the right balance for it. In the past, Ethiopia led its fellow African nations in the dream of independence, but in the coming future, this nation might just lead its continent to an era of African superpowers. Big round of applause for all of you who made it to the end. Not only do I really appreciate it, but it also helps with the YouTube algorithm. Personally, I had a lot of fun researching Ethiopia's history, and I genuinely hope that you might have a growing interest in this country as well. So once again, don't forget to comment down below what country starting with the letter F you'd like to see next, and I'll see you all next time.